Okay. So uh, thank you everyone for coming to uh, what will be uh, the last um, uh, magnet seminar of, of 2020. Uh, we've had uh, a successful run and, and a great turnout for everybody. So uh, thank you all uh, very much for, uh, for your support. Um, for those who, who are new to uh, these seminars, uh, we'll have presentations that are about 20 to, uh, 25 to 30 minutes in length. Um, I kindly ask that you keep your microphones uh, muted uh, during the presentation so that we don't interrupt uh, the speaker. Uh, following the, uh, the seminar, we'll have a sort of 10 to 15 minute uh, discussion. If you do not want to um, unmute yourself to ask a, micro uh, to ask a question, uh, we will answer, we can take questions through the, uh, the text chat. So just simply add no mic. Um, to your question and either myself or Anita uh, will read them out. Um, as always, we have life uh, and all sorts of things going on around us. So if you do have to leave halfway through, it's absolutely not a problem. Uh, just You just need to go. Uh, and just a reminder for the record that uh, the seminars are recorded. Um, and at the end of the seminar, we will have time um, to chat and catch up uh, with everybody if you're interested in that. Uh, and this part of, of the Magnet series uh, isn't recorded uh, and so won't be made publicly available. We turn the recording off and we can all just uh, chit chat and uh, relax. Um, and so I'm um, very pleased to introduce our speaker, our last speaker for uh, 2020, Evdokia Tima um, from the University of uh, Turin. And she will be talking about uh, archaeomagnetic research in Italy. So I'll hand over uh, to Evdokia. Hey, thank you so much. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, we can. Yes, sir. I can see your screen and I mute again. Okay, thank you so much. First of all, I would like to thank a lot Greg and Anita for giving me this opportunity to talk here today a little bit about magnetic research in Italy. And uh, my talk today will be a very brief overview of uh, the available up to now archaeomagnetic data from Italy, presenting some recent advances and concluding with some future perspectives. I would like to say that what I'm going to present is not just the result of my personal work, but is the work of a lot of researchers that during the last decades they have dedicated a part of their research on establishing, promoting and advancing archaeomagnetic research in Italy and also a collaboration with a lot of archaeologists that I would like to personally acknowledge a lot. Okay, as we all know already very well, uh, reconstructing and understanding how the Earth's magnetic field was changing in the past is particularly interesting and important. From one part, it can give us information, indirect information about uh, the processes that take place in the coal mantle boundary and offer some insights about the origin and nature of the geomagnetic field. While from the other part, one, we, once we are able to know how their magnetic field was changing in the past, we can then use this information as a dating tool useful for different fields of earth sciences. Of course, in order to retrieve information about how the Earth's magnetic field was changing in the past and mostly in the time periods where no direct measurements are available, it is necessary to study uh, several kinds of uh, well-dated material, such as, for example, archaeological material, volcanic rocks, uh, lacustrine, or marine sediments, or other kinds of natural archives, such as phalotons, for example. I think uh, that we can say that among all these uh, geomagnetic field recorders, we can consider Anset Bay Clays uh, volcanic rocks as quite precious sources of information, as they mainly uh, present three important advantages. First of all, they carry a quite strong and stable thermal remnant magnetization acquired during the heating at high temperatures and subsequent cooling in the presence of the ambient Anson field. They, and that's of course the case of volcanic rocks or of archaeological materials such as baked clays. 
they can give us also very well dated reliable spot records uh, and uh, as for example the famous Vesuvius eruption that destroyed uh, 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 at the same time preserved forever the ancient city of Pompeii and we know very well that occurred at 79 AD so this way we can have a quite reliable and very well dated spot record and such kind of materials can also be very useful as they can give us information uh, about the full geomagnetic feed vector, including both uh, directional and absolute intensity data. And that's of course the case when we're talking about material uh, still found in situ. We can say that from this point of view, Italy is a quite lucky country is a, a country with a very rich and long cultural heritage with a lot and important archaeological sites that can be potential offer a great a large number of archaeomagnetic data but at the same time Italy is characterized also by a long and important volcanic activity mainly due to the two important and of course still active Italian volcanoes that is Etna and Vesuvius. So from uh, this point of view, and uh, since many decades, a lot of researchers have done great work and we have a lot of uh, paramagnetic investigations coming from volcanic rocks. Well, we can say that more recently, a great interest has also been focused on the study of archaeological artifacts. Nevertheless, even though uh, these are among the most reliable geomagnetic field recorders, still we can say that often errors or problems are related with the paleomagnetic uh, uh, records coming from uh, these uh, um, recorders. Problems that may be related either to their sampling or to the reliability of their dating, or even to some uh, disturbances caused by local, um, local uh, problems as for example the strongly magnetized volcanic elements. So for this reason and in order to be able to collect the most reliable data, very recently in Italy we have tried to compile an updated data set uh, including all the available up to now data coming from both archaeological material and volcanic rocks. Actually, what we have done is a quite crazy thing because we have not just used the global data sets, but we try to retrieve one by one all the original publications, read them carefully in order to obtain all of those metadata information that could help us to evaluate one by one the reliability of the available data. And when I refer to the reliability and quality of the reference data, I, just, I don't just refer to the quality of the experimental techniques applied, but also on the reliability and the quality of the dating of such, uh, of such records. So we have paid particular attention on the archaeo density protocols used, uh, looking, trying to understand and, uh, and, and find out if necessary corrections have been applied. So from this compilation and this uh, careful investigation, some interesting results came out as far as the data from volcanic rocks are concerned, as it was expected. We can see that most of the data come from uh, the two uh, active Italian volcanoes, from Etna and Vesuvius. We have some records from Stroboli, which means Aeolian Islands, and we have also a few data from the Ischia eruption. However, maybe the most interesting result is that uh, we found out that only 57% of the Italian volcanic paleomagnetic records come from well-dated eruptions, which means that almost half of the available volcanic data from volcanic rocks come from eruptions that their traditional age has been questioned or even changed based on geological evidence or archaeomagnetic dating. As far as now are concerned the data from archaeological artifacts, we can see the data, uh, directional data, mostly come from in situ baked clay structures, such as skins, pearls, ovens, while we have also some data coming from in situ burnt sediments, some burnt walls, or some um, well-dated mural paintings. 
What is, however, interesting is that as far as the density data are concerned, that, that we know that for obtaining accurate density results, it's not necessary to collect in situ uh, oriented material. Still, most of the Italian density data come from in situ structures, such as skins or ovens. We have some data from historical, from bricks, from historical data, while only 15% of the available Italian density data come from pottery shards. Okay, if we plot now the available data from uh, Italian archaeological sites that you can see here illustrated with the blue color, uh, together with the data from the, volcanic, from the volcanic rocks illustrated here with the red color, we can see that we have a quite good agreement. However, we can also very easily notice that most of the available data are concentrated in the last 3,000 years, while if we go back in time, the available data are extremely scarce. Actually, as far as the density data are concerned, there are extremely few, and for some millennia, we have no data at all. If we have a more careful look at the data, I would say these are almost the only data available for the last, uh, for the time period before uh, the first millennium BC. There are some data coming from uh, Berg Sentiments published by Kaper et al. in 2014. Well, I would like to point your attention to the oldest full vector geomagnetic field vector, uh, data that we have from Italy and come from this interesting archaeological site of Porto Novo that I would like to spend some few words on this. Here is the archaeological site of Porto Novo. As you can see, it is situated in the Adriatic coast of Italy. And it's quite an interesting site as archaeological excavation had brought into light a very large number of small ovens. These are the small uh, circular ovens made by bay clay that you can see here. If I'm not wrong, there were excavated more than 20 uh, such structures. That according to archaeologists and archaeological evidence, they were probably used for the production of uh, for Cook, food cooking or production of uh, the cooking of bread. So actually one interpretation could be that we have a, a very big uh, bakery of the Neolithic period more than 7,000 years ago. What is particularly interesting from this site, apart from the fact that it's a very rare example of very well-preserved underground ovens from Neolithic period, the good thing is that uh, archaeologists have found a great number of seeds and cereals there. So uh, it can be, uh, this site has been very uh, precisely dated and uh, it belongs to the early Neolithic period between uh, 5600 to 5300 BC. For archaeomagnetic investigation, we have collected samples from three of these ovens that you can see here. Just to show you some, uh, very briefly, some uh, magnetic mineralogy results. We have a uh, quite low passivity mineral. Uh, we have the dominance of, of soft component. And uh, we have obtained also very nice uh, different diagrams, uh, quite um, straight lines that uh, um, go through the origin of our diagrams that gave us also nice mean direction, as you can see here. From this side, uh, we were lucky that it was possible also to uh, have uh, accurate density determination thanks to the collaboration of uh, my colleague Pierre Camps from the Montpellier University that used the multi specimen method to, to obtain accurate density results. So actually, is the oldest full vector uh, data that we have from Italy so far. Okay, going back to our data set, as you can imagine, we have concentrated our interest in the last 3,000 years. As for older periods, the data are extremely scarce to make any further uh, considerations. And we have tried to apply some selection criteria in order to collect the most reliable data. Of course, there is a great discussion which are the best selection criteria to, to apply. Definitely, if we apply very strict selection criteria, that means that we will keep the best, absolutely the best data. But at the same time, it's most probably that we will erase or reject most of our data. So in this case, we tried to, to, to find a compromise and we have applied the selection criteria. We have uh, selected those data that come from a number of specimens equal or higher than five. 
And um, I have to say that going back to the original uh, publications, very often it's not so clear uh, the number of specimens and the number of independently oriented samples. So in this case, we have, uh, we have chosen five, uh, quite large number of specimens, hoping that this way, most of our results will not come from just one single sample. Okay, some selection criteria based on the alpha 95 angle of confidence and the standard deviation. The age error was uh, equal or higher than 200 years. And we also paid particular attention on the archaeo density protocol applied. I have to say that we have rejected all uh, volcanic rocks that come from uh, uh, eruptions that their age has been questioned or it's not so reliable. And all those data that uh, were missing uh, metadata information in order to be able to evaluate the re reliability. Okay, as can, you can imagine after this selection criteria, a tragedy happened. <laughs> all great majority of our data were rejected. So for this reason, we have decided to try to enhance the Italian data set with um, data from nearby countries and mostly cover the time periods that were fully investigated in Italy with uh, data coming from um, sites that are included in 1,000 kilometers radius around Viterbo. Viterbo is situated here, illustrated with a red star. It's situated more or less in the center of Italy. And uh, using this data from the nearby countries, applying the same selection criteria with those from the Italian data set, we have a total of 594 directional uh, data and 94 density high quality reference data. If we have a look on this data, you can see here, these are the, with the light blue, are the data coming from uh, Italian archaeomagnetic uh, sites, both uh, uh, archaeological sites and volcanic rocks. While with uh, the open uh, dark blue dots are the data from the nearby uh, countries. And you can see that we have a quite nice agreement, which means that most more or less our selection criteria seems to have worked. And we can nicely see some uh, clear features of um, uh, the geomagnetic field uh, vector as far as the directional data are concerned. If we have a more careful look on the density data, we can still see that there are some time periods where very few data are available, mostly uh, periods before 400 BC, but also we have an important gap around 880. Using this data as reference data, uh, uh, and thanks to the precious help of uh, Philippe Lanos, uh, we have constructed uh, a continuous, a smooth secular variation cover curve covering the last 3,000 3, years by using the Bayesian statistics. As you can see, and of course, it is, it is expected for the time periods where we have a lot of data, the reference, the reference curves are well constrained and accompanied by, um, by small uh, error envelopes. While if we have a look at the time periods that we have uh, very few data, the curves are not well constrained and are accompanied by quite large uh, error envelopes. If we compare now these curves with some of the regional and global geomagnetic field models, we can see we can see a general good agreement for most of uh, of uh, the period. However, there are also some important differences, as for example, this um, uh, this in decrease in declination that is quite well constrained by the Italian curve that we cannot uh, clearly see in the models, or some uh, uh, discrepancies also in the archaeo density curves that, of course, mainly due to the small number of the Italian reference data available so for some uh, periods. So, um, I would just uh, I would like also to have a, a small reference or electromagnetic dating as one of the most well known applications of electromagnetics is uh, electromagnetic dating, and I would like to show you these uh, recent the results of this recent study of this uh, uh, king that has been excavated at Canosa di Puglia in the southern part of Italy. 
Actually, this is a sampling that was carried out almost a year ago, on October uh, 2019, and uh, it's actually my last sampling campaign before being closed at home for several months due to this uh, unfortunate COVID uh, pandemic situation. So I'm happy to show you these results. It's a sampling um, performed in uh, collaboration with Dr. Italo Mutoni from Surprendents of Poja and the archaeologists from uh, uh, Cooperativa Archaeologia that I would like to, to thank a lot for giving me this uh, opportunity to collect material from this, um, from this structure. This is um, a site that has been excavated and has been discovered as often happens uh, during the last de decades due to the, it's a rescue excavation and found due to the works for a construction of a road uh, between Andret and Canosa di, di Puglia. And as often happens, very often uh, before the, the start of uh, these works, uh, there was a preliminary archaeological investigation and there were found three kilns. I will show just the results from the first kiln that, as you can see, is quite a well preserved kiln. Here we had the perfurnium, here is the main combustion chamber, and this nice arch that is still uh, preserved. And this kiln was most probably used for the production of bricks. For archaeomagnetic investigation, we have taken 15 uh, bricks from the main combustion chamber, all of them oriented in situ with uh, magnetic and solar compass and inclinometer. Here you can see some of the results obtained. We have a nice uh, a strong magnetization, nice linear Zeta diagrams, and we have obtained a mean direction, a well constrained mean, uh, mean direction that then we have used to date. The, uh, the last heating, of course, the last use of this skin by comparison with the new Italian secular variation curves. And here you can see the comparison of the declination, inclination, and the, here the um, combination of the probability density. And for the dating, we have used the archaeogenic MATLAB tool. And we can see that we have three possible uh, dating intervals that uh, based on the archaeological context of this uh, structure, we can say that most probably it was last used sometime between 480 and 530 AD. The good thing with this, uh, with this uh, structure is that the archaeologists going on with their excavation, they have found in the perfumium of uh, this uh, kiln this characteristic uh, rectangular brick with this nice sign of P that is uh, um, quite uh, um, characteristic. It's an identification sign of the production workshop and it can further uh, confirm that uh, this king belongs uh, more or less to the 5th to, uh, to 6th century AD, which means that we are more or less in the correct way. Concluding, uh, if I would like to say a few words about the future, I think the best thing I can say is that there is still a lot of work that we have to do. Definitely, future research in Italy should be focused on uh, obtaining new high quality data, if possible, reference data from time periods before the first millennium BC, where the data we have up to now are very scarce. It would be particularly important to, to try to obtain more high quality archaeo density data and uh, it will be interesting to have more data about uh, the beginning of the first millennium BC in order to try to investigate and to see if the Iron Age Levantine anomaly is also seen in the Italian peninsula. And I would say that would be also very important to have full vector uh, geomagnetic uh, field data from uh, the same well-dated material. Definitely, a particular attention should be always paid on the dating of the reference data. That is very important. Uh, Archomagnetic data sets, uh, databases, it's a live organism that should be continuously updated and fitted. Here are some references and uh, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Here you can see a photo from Torino. Of course, it has nothing to do with the magnetism, but during these difficult times that we cannot travel, I thought that uh, magnet seminars could also contribute on make us traveling a little bit around the world. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Evdokia. Um, 
Thank you. A big uh, round of applause for Enrique. Thanks for your presentation. Um, so if anybody has a question, can drop on the uh, chat box or raise their hands. And I'm sure Enrique will be happy to answer your questions. Definitely. So I, I will jump in with a quick question because I, I, as a host, I can't actually raise my hand. But, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I kind of noticed that there is um, a bit of a split, uh, obviously, in, in the distribution uh, of the data north-south because uh, Vesuvius and Etna are, are um, located uh, in southern Italy. And the volcanic data um, tend to, to, to come from the younger ages. Um, and given that, that essentially your, your data sampling is across a diameter of about 2,000 kilometers, uh, I'm wondering, is there, is there any difference uh, between the northern regions and the southern regions? Um, can you pick out more fine scale uh, detail um, in, in the data sets? Or is there not enough data to really look at, at that north-south uh, divide? Mm -hmm. No, actually, I have not noticed any any systematic or regular differences between the, the north and the south and the, the, the southern part. And uh, I have to say that there is not uh, even very in, big differences between uh, um, archaeomagnetic data from uh, archaeological material and volcanic rocks. What um, uh, I, I would have tried also to use a smaller radius uh, to to be more concentrated to the Italian territory, but unfortunately it, it uh, didn't enrich a lot our data set. You can see we have huge, uh, huge uh, missing of data. What it, it is interesting, however, to notice is the great, as uh, Greg said, the most of the volcanic rocks come from recent. Uh, um, yeah, more recent time periods and uh, if we have uh, a look here we can see that even the data coming from the very recent periods almost the, le the last few hundred of years still we have a greater dispersion of the data uh, as far as the density results are concerned. A lot of this data that you can see here, however, come from well dated eruptions that, and the many researchers have used these eruptions to to test their archive density uh, results or archive density techniques. However, yes, we have a lot of dispersion. And I also have to, to say that the, the tragedy that happened during the rejection of the data due to quality criteria really um, it was very important as far as the density data are concerned, the, and mainly the density data from volcanic rocks. So do we have uh, any uh, further questions? There is one in the chat that I can read. Yeah, on you go. So it's uh, by Elizabeth Han, uh, Sandra Elizabeth Han, sorry. Do you see a difference in thermal stability and therefore also in the stability, reliability in the data obtained from kilns for, bre for bread baking, brick production and shares? Yes. Uh, the, the stability of uh, thermal remnants magnetization of kins really is really excellent. Uh, in almost all material that I have studied, but also the material from um, literature and data from literature, they are very, very stable. And I have to say that I have noticed also the quality of the density data coming from, uh, from bricks and uh, from kins is really good, it's really good. So they, are no, they are very stable. Probably heating and reheating and high, and high temperatures make them particularly stable. Okay, thank you. I can see Richard Holm waving his hand, uh, his physical hand, not the electronic hand. Yeah. So, um, hi, Doc here. Um, I um, have a slightly different view generally on selection criteria than many. Um, when you do your model, what happens if you test all the data you've rejected against your model? Well, it, uh, the truth is that by rejecting our data, what happened is that we mostly rejected data that were clear outliers and uh, data that even with, um, with easy observation would be rejected because we were really outside. If we 
take them out, uh, the difference is not such so important. Uh, it's not so important. What uh, we noticed, however, is that the selection criteria on the density data it, it much improved the, the agreement among the available data. Thank you. You're welcome. So we have a question uh, by Shelby. Um, so in the chat, uh, um, she asked, when you were doing their archival work, were you reanalyzing their vector average or accepting them as it is? I didn't get it when I, I revised the previous data, if I revised also the vectors. No, 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 I have not uh, taken um, the, the original uh, measurements. I uh, had no access, we had no access to the original measurements. We just evaluated the information given in the original um, papers, uh, saying about the reliability, how many specimens, uh, if there were doubts on the archaeological age, uh, if um, other works later on change the previous archaeological age, as sometimes happens. Also because as far as uh, the, the reliability of dating it does not concern only the volcanic rocks. Very often, archaeological excavations that go on, more data come up, uh, and so the, the initial evaluation of the dating may be changed or re-evaluated as far as more dating results come up, more excavation findings uh, come up. Mm -hmm. That's why I say that the database are a live organism and should be continuously feeded and, uh, and updated. Mm -hmm. so, um, so I just have a follow-up question. So the, the, um, do you reject the site or the studies that have re-evaluated the dates or you just use the re-evaluated dates? I use the re-evaluated dates. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And following up about that, I was, oh, sorry. For, excuse me, for uh, volcanic rocks, when the dates were re-evaluated re based on electromagnetic data, they were not uh, included, uh, because otherwise it would be a circular reasoning. Uh, mm -hmm. And obviously now there is a, the new radiocarbon curve uh, from Reimer 2020, so we kind of have to re recalibrate everything that we've done. So. Yeah, <laughs> I agree with you, it's a living uh, organism, the database, and like Max uh, Brown can, uh, and yeah. colleagues can uh, prove that. And also what? obviously Andy Biggin. So, uh, Sandra Elizabeth Hahn raised her hand. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. Um, no, I have a question to the, you showed your data for the intensity, and yeah. I, there's for the 400 years, you have a gap of 10 microtesla in your data. So from where you compare like the literature data and then your data points. And for yeah. one, I think for 500 years, you have like two data points and a difference of around 10 microtesla. How do you explain that? Or what do you think is an um, explanation for that? You're, uh, you are referring in this data here? Yes, like, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's very interesting because, um, particularly for this time period, that uh, has been, um, I was very curious and very sad at the same time because for this 800 AD, it has been already observed, uh, like in the Beria Peninsula, a quite high density um, uh, value around 800 AD. And uh, I was particularly interested in this period uh, that unfortunately we don't have enough data to, to make conclusions. This data one comes from um, a study in, uh, in France, if, if I'm not wrong and one in Switzerland and they are they have a, a difference in data I think less than than uh, 50 years or something like that both of these data seems to be of high quality data this one gave very high values and this one quite low values but uh, I had no re reason to to reject them okay so, yes yeah. thanks I was actually referring to the 500 years Oh, the archaeomagnetic data. Now it was a nice explanation, thanks, but uh, I was actually more curious about the 500 years. This difference is quite particular, that's why I, I thought yeah. you were very yeah. good. Sorry, you're talking about 500 AD? Yeah. This data, okay. Yeah. 
Okay, these data are two data from Italy and two from, uh, I'm not sure if it's France or not, but once again, when we went to, to, to see what's, what's wrong, there was no, nothing wrong that was easy to, to, to detect, let's say. I, I am afraid that very often, um, let's say, disturbances on the data, apart from la laboratory techniques or laboratory problems that cannot be detected, it's very often um, a problem on the dating that we cannot really uh, see. It passes, uh, uh, it passes very easily the selection criteria, but maybe it's not so precise. So it's more probably a dating problem, which, okay. I don't know, but it could be, it could be, yes. Okay. Thanks very much. You are welcome. Thank you. Uh, have... So we have a follow, oh, you want to say something? Yes, I was just talking about diversity data. I wanted to say that also it's quite sad that for the so interesting period of uh, the beginning of the last millennium, we just have one single data, so. <laughs> Anyway, more will come, we're confident. Um, so we have uh, Shelby uh, asking a follow-up question uh, and she asks, uh, did you use the past magnetic statistical method as a filter? What is the past statistical method? Sorry. M past magnetic statistical method as a filter? I, I don't know what is the past magnetic statistical. Uh, not quite sure. Uh, me. Oh, here, here. Like the mug step or, or PCs. PCAs, yes, of course. See, for my, for my own data, I have used the principal component uh, analysis, while for the um, literature data, I just have taken the, the mean, cal mean values calculated by the authors. The, the main point of our uh, update compilation was to understand if the reliability of these data, uh, if those data were reliable, but uh, we have not recalculated the literature data. This is certainly be uh, an, uh, an add value, but it's a very time consuming and it requires the original data to be available, which are only available in MAGIC and not uh, uh, and I don't know what exact numbers, but I, I bet not so many. Uh, so um, Shelby says there is a lot of great work. Thank you for compiling this data. Nice Thank overview you. from Kathy. Great work, congratulations, a success. Oh, here, uh, from Despina Condo Pulo. Sorry if I pronounce it wrong. No, okay. A question on 600, 800, the lack of data. Uh, yes, I'm just uh, surprised to see that the intensity data have this big uh, uh, empty space here. Uh, what about the Geneve et al. data of medieval? Um, yes, uh, they are here. They are here. These are the, the very recently published data by Geneve collaborators in 2020. No, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Medieval period, you can see here. Evdokia, no, I don't mean the Italian data. I mean the French pottery data, which, uh, if I remember well, are situated somewhere around 800 and the one thousand. And because most of the French data are included in your confidence circle, so if I recall well, uh, there should be data of around between 800 and 1,000 from French pottery. I mean, I can go back to the original publication. Anyway, uh, just an observation. We have the same difficulty in obtaining intensity data from Greece within uh, the period 600, uh, 800, because uh, of several reasons, there is uh, a lack of material. And in this way, we cannot catch the supposed high value around 700 to 800. But I will really, I'm very surprised. I will look to the literature, for, sorry for this gap. Anyway, thank you for your nice presentation of the Kia. We have the opportunity to talk about that later or in another room.
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's interesting. Yes, it's interesting. It's sad that there are not a lot of data for that period. Mm -hmm. I have to say that the selection criteria applied about the five uh, specimens cut off a lot of data as well. Then um, the selection criteria rejected a lot of, uh, of data. Most of them uh, because of the smaller number of specimens and uh, the um, and uh, the, um, uh, uh, and the standard deviation uh, value, but mostly because of the small number of specimens. Thank you. We have a question of uh, Max Brown that I almost missed. Sorry. Okay. So uh, he asked, uh, can you comment on whether the Bayesian model fit overfits the data? Could a simpler model have a good fit? Uh, we haven't tried, tried another model. We have tried uh, this Bayesian uh, reconstruction and I think it fits quite well the data, but of course it fits well the data when we have a lot of data. <laughs> when uh, we don't have a lot of data, it doesn't uh, fit. Also here with the two results, you can see we have a very um, large error envelope uh, and uh, in, also in other time periods, it, cannot perfectly fit the data. But when we have a lot of data, I think it, it, uh, it fits well. Thank you. So uh, we have a, a question from Javier and then Andrei Kostarov uh, raised uh, his hand. So have you TRM data with the historical data set within your spherical region? like uh, Jonker et al. 2003 or EastMag database? If, if I have used historical data, that's the question because I missed uh, The question, sorry. For the last three, four centuries, have you compared the TRM data with historical data set within your spherical region? No, we, no, we have not used either in the, um, either in the cal calculation or in the comparison the historical data actually uh, for these uh, very recent periods uh, uh, we have just used in all our caves are based only on archaeomagnetic data either from archaeological material or from volcanic rocks and historical data are not included. Okay, thank you. Uh, Andrei? <coughs> <clears throat> uh, hi, okay. thank you for this nice, nice talk. I wonder, uh, did you try to plot your intensity data as a function of the material you, you used for, uh, in, uh, for intensity? I mean, uh, separately yeah. for kilns, uh, batteries, and etc. That's a what? good idea. No, we don't. We ah, haven't okay, done. so great. It would be re really interesting to see because, uh, and y your data set is a nice thing to uh, to do that because it's very rare that you have so uh, at least several types of material in the same location. Yeah. Uh, maybe you do it in the future. Yeah, that, that would be also interesting to see uh, how reliable are, for example, the determination from pottery or from kings. Yeah, from, that's, that, yeah, that was my point, actually. Yeah, well, we haven't done that. That's a nice yeah. idea. Yeah, great. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Good talk. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, is anybody else have questions? If so, I guess I have one quick sort of follow on just from from Andre's comment. I mean, um, what consideration have you given to the uh, corrections or lack of corrections for you know cooling rates, anisotropy, uh, and these kind of things, especially cooling rate because it's a, a really tricky one to you know pin down how much of a correction should be uh, should be applied. And I guess that's kind of probably what one Andre is kind of getting at by looking at the, the different materials as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that, that could be important to have uh, both an isotropy correction and cooling rate correction. Uh, I have to say that the, in most of the recent data, both corrections are, are included. Uh, so that's uh, a quite good thing. 
Also, in some older data, these corrections have been uh, somehow re-estimated or taken in consideration. The, the biggest problem is uh, with the oldest data that in most cases miss both anisotropy and pooling rate. And um, mainly when we refer to data from pottery or even well-shaped bricks or tiles, the, um, the anisotropy correction could be also very important, uh, very important. So, um, Definitely, there is a lot of work to do as far as density studies in Italy is, uh, are concerned. We have uh, very few data and um, sometimes not uh, the best one. So they, we have to con get concentrated uh, and uh, do much more job on that. Yeah. It's time consuming, uh, it, uh, the, the, the low success rate, uh, rate that can be some disadvantages, but we have to do it. <laughs> Thank you. We feel you. <laughs> the one who are working with the poly intensity, arc intensity. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we know what you've been through. Okay, so anybody else has questions? No? For now, we don't. Um, I, I may have questions, but uh, we can, uh, I want to leave a room for others. Okay, then, um, so the, uh, it's interesting how we all struggle with selection criteria and they still remain really subjective. Um, of course, as you said, the more strict criteria we use, the less data we have. That's kind of a, a given, it's expected. Um, but the, in, while selecting um, the, the previous studies, I was wondering if you can use kind of several sets of criteria and they weight them mm -hmm. in a way that you consider all the data you have rather than just uh, um, get rid of them in a way, cut them off, kind of give them a weight rather than just... Uh, have, you, have you thought of it? Have you done something? That's something that very often uh, we observe in the publications and uh, many people apply this uh, weighting on the data and that's a good idea. We have not done it also because um, we wanted just to be sure that we have uh, the best data as far as, as it is possible. Of course, keeping more data, even if they are weighted less, could be good to have a, a much richer, uh, more data available. But um, we decided here that we should work on, on the best data possible according to the selection criteria. Of course, if we were more strict, it would be even the best data, but uh, um, the number would be very few, very, very small. What is interesting, however, with selection criteria is the um, the, the errors on in dating that uh, usually we use a cutoff uh, uh, a cutoff criterion based on um, the interval of dating, like one two hundred uh, one hundred two hundred years. But um, it's difficult to to understand how reliable is this dating. So many data that are not so well dated pass the standard selection criteria and we use them for modeling or for global data sets. That's a, I think it's an important problem uh, as far as archimagnetic data are concerned. And it's a problem that cannot be easily solved because we don't have direct control on the dating or in the, on the updating of dating as time passes. Okay, thank you. And I was wondering also about how you dealt with the problem of uh, the different methods that have been used uh, beyond the Tellier Tellier methods. I don't know how you treat them and weight them or did you consider them all as no, actually, uh, we were from this point of view, we were quite lucky. Let's say that most of the of the data from uh, Italy and nearby countries come from Tellier or Triax method or multi specimens. What we we did and we tried to pay attention of if we are dealing with Tellier method to be sure that the, um, anisotropy correction or some other correction have been taken into consideration. 
and more or less we try to, to individually evaluate the reliability of data. We haven't used the, such the cutoff, uh, cutoff criteria. Okay, thank you. So anybody else has questions? Otherwise we can switch to uh, the informal part of the talks. Oh, Jorg has, has questions, yes. Yeah, sorry, I have a question uh, with respect to the quality of the data from this Neolithic kiln, which was used for baking bread, and with the quality of, of the other kiln, which is used to, to make bricks. So with respect to the temperatures, because uh, to bake bread, you, you don't need such a high temperature. Is there any difference in the, in the quality? Well, there, there has been uh, a study about the heating temperatures of these uh, of these structures. In fact, uh, we are not talking about very high temperatures. It was, uh, if I remember well, around uh, 400, 450 degrees. But uh, we still, it was uh, uh, heated enough to give us, uh, I think, nice directional uh, results. But definitely the data from the, the kiln, and the temperatures uh, arrived in the kiln were um, uh, much higher. Uh, we're talking about um, temperatures higher than 600 de degrees, and uh, the magnetization was much stronger, mm -hmm. much stronger in this case. But once again, we have nice, uh, nice, uh, um, nice directional results, nice um, uh, mean value, well constrained. Okay, thank you. So maybe Greg, uh, you can uh, wrap up now. Uh, yep, I just wanted to. Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Um, so no, thank you everyone for for coming and thank you uh, for a fantastic talk uh, today. Uh, and I want to take this chance to thank um, all of our speakers um, for for twenty twenty. Uh, I've actually I've lost count how many we've had. I think uh, this is the ninth or tenth. Um, but if, if you want to um, catch up on any of the uh, speakers that we've had this year, um, most of the videos are now are available on, on YouTube and we have more information on our uh, Magnets website, which is hosted with uh, Earthref. Um, so please um, have a look and catch up with some of the presentations that you might have missed there. Um, this, today's presentation will be uploaded uh, to the website shortly and it will have um, a DOI. So if you find anything interesting or useful in this presentation or any of the other presentations, uh, it is a citable object uh, and, and you can give um, Evdekia and, and all of our presenters credit for their uh, excellent and, and hard work. Um, just a, a bit of a heads up for the schedule um, uh, into next year. So in December, we're going to have a, a break um, because AGU will be taking up most of December with um, their uh, fall meeting. Um, we will come back in, in 2021. Now, here in the UK, at the very beginning um, of uh, January, we will typically host um, our UK Magnetic Interactions, our local domestic meeting. Um, this year, because of, of lockdown, we can't hold that meeting in person. So we will be holding a, a virtual uh, version of this, and we're going to be hosting parts of it through uh, the Magnets uh, seminar platform. Um, so please keep your eyes open for uh, any announcements for that. Um, we will be opening up um, attendance uh, to the international community um, for people who are interested in finding out what kind of science um, the magnetics community is, is doing in the UK. Um, but uh, there should be more information coming out about that in the next uh, couple of weeks. So please uh, keep your eyes open. Uh, sorry, Anita. Yes, uh, there is also the magic meeting that you may yes. have seen in the GP map. Uh, it's uh, the 19th to the 21st. It's on Zoom as well, available for everybody. It's free and it's going to be a good uh, uh, three days of talks and, and things. Uh, you can email me or Nick or anybody for more information. Thanks, Greg. Sorry. No, thank you. I, I forgot to put that one on. I was a little bit late in making these slides this afternoon. Um, but um, we'll be kicking off the, the main series of, of the Magnet Seminars at some point, uh, either in February or into March uh, next year. Um, so we're looking for um, speakers for uh, the 2021 
uh, magnet seminar. So if anybody is interested in giving a presentation, please uh, reach out to either myself or Anita. Uh, we can start uh, arranging the uh, schedule for 2021. Um, and as always, um, we are always welcome to uh, feedback, any ideas or criticisms um, and suggestions that folks have for magnets. Um, and once again, just thank you everyone for, for joining.